Hello, hello. Good afternoon, King. Hello. So, are you ready for your semi-few questions? I am ready for my questions. All right. So let's start it off with, what's your name? My name is Jason Chen. All right. So, what specialty are you in? So I'm. It's a bit of a mouthful. Okay. Uh, my specialty is otorhinolaryngology, head and neck surgery. Okay. So is it like ENT? And so ENT for short. ENT for short. All right. So what position do you hold right now? So I'm an associate professor within our department. Okay. So where are you originally from? So you look, you know, non-local, I would say. <laughs> so I'm originally from Hong Kong. I grew oh, up okay. here. Um, uh, my dad's Chinese, my mom's British. Um, but I spent also a lot of time overseas uh, as well uh, before coming back to Hong Kong. Hmm. So that means where do you study medicine then? So I studied medicine in England. So I went to um, King's College in London for medical school. Oh, so they didn't study in like CHK then? No, nope. okay. unfortunately not. Okay. So what special do you want to go to on the first day of medical school? So when I was actually um, first day in medical school, I wanted to do uh, cardiac surgery. Hmm. So that's initially what I wanted and planned on doing until I think uh, I graduated uh, and did my intern year uh, in, in, in the UK. Hmm. So wh where are we right now, actually? So this is the um, minimally invasive uh, surgical center. Um, and this is a, a training center. We run a lot of workshops here. Mm -hmm. And just so it happens, we're actually running a workshop here tomorrow, uh, kind of a head and neck dissection course. So this is the lab that we'll be using. and. Um, we'll be uh, having some demonstrations that are broadcast overseas, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, some live demos, uh, demonstration and dissection here by uh, trainees as well. Uh, we also do robotic training as well in this center, uh, in the room next door as well. Hmm. So it's actually, this is my first time being here actually. <laughs> so what about like, you want to study cardiology right in the first day? I want to do cardiac surgery. A cardiac surgery. Also then, what changes the mind about like cardiothoracic then? Um, so, so I, Initially wanted to do cardiothoracic surgery, but I changed my mind because um, one, I did a lot of experience during my uh, intern year in the U.S. in cardiac uh, ICU. Um, and uh, seeing the workload uh, that mm -hmm. was lifelong, it goes into as long as, as no matter how senior you are. And the other thing was the job prospects of, of cardiac surgeons at that time point when I was um, just uh, graduating was not that great. So those, those changed my mind uh, in terms of pursuing that as a career. Mm -hmm. so, so hypothetically speaking, what kind of specialty is definitely not for you? What kind of specialty is definitely not for me? Anything medical. <laughs> okay. Uh, is really not so you're for more me. a surgeon than a medical doctor then? More, more in that case, yes. Okay, so what about ENT then? What is the moment? Is there like a specific moment that you realize you want to do ENT? So I never had any exposure to ENT during medical school. The only oh, time I really had ENT exposure was as an intern in England. So I had three months um, as a house officer. Uh, in ENT and that actually changed my mind uh, completely about ENT and um, made me want to pursue that as a career. Oh, okay. So that means ENT is sort of your calling after these training, you can, I would say. Um, it's actually a bit of a fortuitous event. So, okay. so my career path is not the usual career path. Mm -hmm. um, so I did um, my intern year in the UK. I worked for another year in the UK before moving to the US. Um, and initially I was doing general surgery in the US um, mm. and a lot of my close friends and good friends who are still close friends to me uh, were in ENT mm -hmm. um, and I actually subsequently uh, went to another place to pursue general surgery um, but where I was initially uh, my friends called me back and said there was an opening uh, in ENT in our mm -hmm. hospital do you want to come back um, and I went back I interviewed I got the job uh, and that's how I ended up actually having a career in ENT uh, afterwards that's kind of a very convoluted story for <laughs> how to get into ENT. So what about like how long does the ENT training usually take then? So for Hong Kong, if you do, if you do ENT training, you have your house officer year, then you have your basic surgical trainee uh, training, which would be about two to three years. Then you have four years of HST. Then you become a fellow mm -hmm. uh, of the College of uh, ENT. Mm -hmm. So do you think like ENT in general is a very competitive specialty? It is a competitive specialty. I mean, we're a small specialty uh, mm -hmm. within Hong Kong um, and the uh, number of posts that are open each year uh, vary in number. There can be none previous years. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, there has been more, but you're talking about single digit number of posts oh, uh, for ENT training. That's quite a few. <laughs> okay, so did you subspecialize in, within ENT? So yeah, I did subspecialize within ENT. So within ENT, my subspecialty is, is head and neck surgery. Mm -hmm. um, so mostly deals with head and neck tumors, head and neck cancers. Mm. So do you think, uh, out of your experience for so many years, what is the most unique part of your specialty? Then? So one of the most unique part of our specialty is actually the 
the actual breadth of skill sets that you need. So mm -hmm. even within our specialty, there are many different subspecialties. So for example, otology, which is ear surgery, mm -hmm. uh, you do a lot of bone work with surgery. Uh, if for me, head, neck, cancer, and tumors, uh, we do a lot of bone work, but we also do a lot of soft tissue work as well, mm -hmm. uh, which is more like general surgery in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have uh, facial plastics. We have rhinology where you do a lot of endoscopic work. So there's a huge variety of what, uh, skill sets that you need to use and, and do within ENT, which makes it kind of unique amongst other specialties. Mm -hmm. So with such breadth and depth in terms of specialties, why do you think, why should someone choose the specialty you are in right now? Um, I think they should choose a specialty that, that we are in right now if, um, if they really kind of uh, enjoy teamwork. Uh, we are the so-called nicer surgeons um, uh, and uh, we're because of a friendly bunch uh, and I think we're not as uh, uptight maybe uh, mm -hmm. as uh, general surgery would be. Um, so if you want to be kind of a happier, nicer surgeon, maybe you want to join ENT. Okay, that sounds a very good proposition <laughs> actually. <laughs> so, on the contrary, why, why should someone not choose a specialty? Like, what kind of quality that they, they have that is not suited for them? So I think it's still a surgical specialty. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the workload can be heavy at times, and especially uh, head and neck uh, surgery is, is more of like a general surgery specialty with a heavier workload. So th the one thing is don't come with an expectation that it's, it's really an easy life uh, coming into ENT. Okay. Uh, there is still quite a lot of work to be done, um, and particularly taking care of head and neck uh, cancer patients. Mm, so actually the heavy workload does carry over from other surgery to ENT then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So do you think any there is any stereotype about a specialty then? Um, so for, for us, I guess the stereotype is uh, that we have a good work-life balance, mm -hmm. uh, good lifestyle for ENT. That's what most people kind of appreciate and think uh, that about our specialty. Okay. Actually, I did, found, like, I did think that ENT was going to be relatively chill compared <laughs> to general surgery. <laughs> Apparently, I'm wrong. <laughs> so is there any stereotype about a specialty that might be true? Um, I mean, I think you, you, you are right to a degree that the work-life balance, the, mm -hmm. um, the call is not as heavy as general surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, that's definitely for sure, but it's, don't expect it not to be anything. Okay. Um, you still have to work your stuff to be on call, um, and there are quite sick patients uh, and dire patients as well. Okay, so how about let's go to other room? Let's sure. Go sure. <laughs> so, um, Back then, did you get pimped by like consultant or a type? Every time. Every time. <laughs> Always in the offering room, you get pimped. Oh, it, was it a hard like learning experience or very tough? Um, I think it varies. You have different mentors who uh, teach you uh, in very, very different ways. There are some very old school type mm -hmm. um, surgeons that um, would uh, yell at you, um, uh, would tell you off. Um, I've seen things thrown around the offering rooms. That's, that, that can happen. Okay. Um, and um, so this is the seminar room. Some will pimp you and ask you lots of questions during the operating room. Mm -hmm. um, the main thing is the expectation of where I trained is that you would read up on every case mm -hmm. uh, before, the, uh, before you did the operation. We would actually have to call our attending surgeons uh, the day before the procedure and discuss each case with them that we're doing in the operating room. So that's something that uh, is pretty unique. I don't think it's done here necessarily all the time. Okay. So, um what do you actually do on an average day, like from like morning to you left the hospital, usually routine? Um, so I don't think I have a routine. Okay. Uh, it's more of a routine week. I don't have a day that is particularly routine. Um, so uh, just I usually start, I get, get to work around 7.15, 7.30. Um, and it may be P-dub, but it depends uh, also if I have private patients in Union or in the new CU Medical Center. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially that's the time I start my day. Uh, if I come to P-dub, uh, do some office work, uh, and then we usually have ward rounds around 8.15. Mm -hmm. um, that's about the time frame we start. Mondays is usually our offering day. Monday, okay. Um, and usually it's from 8.30 to 8.30 or 9 at night. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the operating time. Mm -hmm. Tuesdays is usually um, uh, clinic day. Uh, I have clinic in senior medical center in the afternoon. Here in the morning, it's either some uh, uh, clinics or some meetings. Uh, Wednesday is my, my mostly administrative day, or if I have any other operations to do uh, mm -hmm. elsewhere or in private, uh, I will do it on Wednesdays as well. And then Thursday um, is usually whole day clinic. Friday morning clinic, um, and afternoon I catch up on uh, research with my collaborators usually. 
um, and weekends, uh, Saturdays, I do operate mostly as well. Wow, that is an intense, like, quite packed schedule for a week, actually. <laughs> That's what it is, it's kind yeah, of like. It is, it is. So you gotta answer the question, the balance between procedure and clinic. So how about, what is the craziest case you've encountered? Um, so I think the craziest case I've done was in, when I was in the US. So it was mm -hmm. a, um, a paraganglioma of the skull base. Um, and it was, we went on and did it for about 23, 24 hours. Um, so this was a combination uh, of, with neurosurgery, with neurotologists um, and head and neck surgeons. Uh, removing a tumor involving that extended intracranially mm -hmm. uh, and drilling the temporal bone, preserving the internal carotid artery, and also uh, removing the tumor from the neck. Um, this was this gentleman was, I think, in his 20s or 30s, pretty young. Mm -hmm. um, but the surgery, uh, because of the, um, the difficult anatomy and the size of the tumor, it, it took over 20 hours to, to get the surgery done. Um, so that's one of the longest cases, I would say. I mean, crazy cases, we've done a fair number of crazy cases. Uh, besides something like that. Wait, but how, how, like for 23 hours, do you, do you have time to go to washroom or something? Yes, so we tag team. So there's different teams. So there's oh, neurosurgery, okay. uh, neurotology, and us. so we divide, divvy it up into, into different time points where we needed to be there. Okay, that, that's, that's a relief. <laughs> Actually, yeah, you don't yeah. have to hold your bladder for like 23 no, hours. No, you, you can't. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So how often do you work like shadow, medical students shadow you? Um, so for medical students that attach to our, our department, they mostly attach in the final year, so mm -hmm. year six, and they attach for two weeks. Two weeks. Um, within our department. Um, and then I see them for, uh, if, uh, the problem right now with, with COVID as well, they can't always come to our clinic um, mm -hmm. because uh, what we do is an aerosol generating procedure oh, yeah. when we look with the camera. So unfortunately, they can't come to our clinics that often. So my exposure is mainly on the ward when I do ward rounds oh, and teaching them as well. That's a bummer, actually. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, so... Um, what is the craziest or like difficult question asked by patients? So I mean, I always get asked, um, mm. how long do I have to live uh, by patients? Mm. Um, and what are my chances of being here in five years? Mm. Um, I think there's, there's, there's no straight answer. Every patient is different. Mm -hmm. uh, we have numbers um, as a population, but we don't have individual numbers for each individual person. So mm. I try not to pinpoint them down, um, but um, make sure that they're kind of optimistic, uh, but realistic mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't like to give them numbers uh, which are not as meaningful individually uh, mm -hmm. for these particular mm -hmm. patients. That's actually quite a dilemma that doctors have to deal with, like deal with them psychologically, but from a realistic standpoint, what kind of figure you can give them? That's yeah. difficult. And their families as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. But so how many patients do you see on average day then? Um, so, uh, for one clinic, we usually see on average about 28 patients. 28 patients. Yeah. Okay. So, what has been the most number of patients you've seen? You, you didn't restrict to ENT, it can be like houseman or any time period. Um, so, I think, because I've only worked in Hong Kong in my specialty, mm -hmm. um, so I would say about 30 patients. Because when I, when I trained in the, in the US and UK, definitely we didn't have to see as many patients as we, we do here right now in Hong mm -hmm. Kong. Mm -hmm. So, like, what is how many hours do you actually work in an average week then? Um, I would say uh, 80. I'm not sure. Cause I'm not wow. sure. Because um, I still work when I get home. So, uh, so True. <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's about an 80 hour work. I don't, wow, I don't that's, really count. That's actually quite a lot. Like, compared <laughs> to like last time we interviewed Professor Long, it's like, I think it's eight, nine to six and nine to seven. Yeah, and so it's quite a different like medical versus surgery, like the, the time and hours spent. So like, what time do you normally get up then? Like, uh, I usually get up around 6.30, 6.45. Well, that's pretty reasonable actually. I, I thought like gonna be like five or like, you know. No, I, I used to, I used to. Used to, oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> so then what time do you usually leave the hospital? Um, that varies. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say the average would be around uh, 6.30, 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to other places. Yep. Let's go. So, um, do you need to take call? Like I do. I do take call now, um, and um, it's a little bit of a luxury now. I'm a, I'm a kind of third call now, mm -hmm. so um, and I'm uh, less that I have to come into the hospital for that mm -hmm. for for anything in that mm -hmm. in that call pool. So. Uh, can you explain what is like first call, second call, third call there? Yeah, so first call is usually in-house and mm -hmm. it's usually the trainees who are on call. 
um, and uh, they do a lot of work. They're pretty busy usually in house mm -hmm. um, uh, dealing with um, patients on the ward and any consultations that they have. The second call is usually at home, um, and they come in for any issues or any emergency surgeries that need to be done, and they cover here and also in the other Seoul Hospital as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, the third call is, is, is a layer above that, um, and they deal with any issues that the second call may not be comfortable with um, in that scenario, but they, they're called much less, much uh, less. Than, the yeah, okay. than the second call. So actually, do you think you're a day shift or a night shift person? Day shift. I cannot day deal shift. with night shifts. <laughs> I've done that the before. Hours. <laughs> it's just miserable. So, so <laughs> in that case, what is the longest um, working shift you've gone through? Um, so I think... The longest shift, I would say, uh, would still be around 36, 38 hours. But um, what really, I, I don't think people really experience in Hong Kong is getting up at 3 or 4, to work, start work at 4 a.m. in the morning, um, and then being on call every other day for like two months. So uh, that's something I had to do when I was in the U.S. Uh, mm. for a period of time. So that is tough, uh, I would say, and it's not, not easy to do, getting up that early in the morning to go to work. Yeah, I mean, like, it's physically and mentally challenging, actually. It is, it is. So then, um, what kind of um, most common advice you would give to patients, actually? Most common advice to give to patients? I tell a lot of my patients, particularly in the general OPD, mm -hmm. um, how to use nasal saline to rinse their noses or irrigate their noses. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of allergic rhinitis patients. Okay. So that's probably one of the, one of the most common things I, I tell patients. Mm -hmm. So when, like, um, so when going back to the question on the working shift, how do you stay awake during the shift? Like, is it coffee, tea, Red Bull? What kind of things help you get awake? Uh, for me, it's hmm. usually, and this is a bad habit, I usually okay. get Coke Zero in the morning. Um, oh. <laughs> so Coke Zero is, is usually what has kept me awake. Okay. Uh, and that's what I tend to go to, um, <laughs> um, particularly when I was working in the US. That was mm -hmm. my go-to, yeah. Okay, so let's go to the other area then. Okay. 